After leaving Vienna, and long before you come to Budapest, the Danube enters a region of singular loneliness and desolation, where its waters spread away on all sides, and the country becomes a swamp for miles upon miles, covered by a vast sea of willow bushes. In high flood, this great acreage of sand and willow-grown islands is almost topped by water, but in normal seasons, the bushes bend and rustle in the winds. Now, they never attain the dignity of trees, these willows. They have no rigid trunks. They remain bushes with rounded tops and soft outline, swaying on slender stems that answer to the least pressure of the wind, supple as grasses, and so continuously shifting that they somehow give the impression that the entire plain is alive. Happy to slip beyond the control of its banks, the Danube here wanders at will, tearing at its sandy edges, carrying away masses of shore and willow clumps, and forming new islands which shift daily in size and shape. This fascinating part of the river's life begins soon after leaving Pressburg, and my companion and I, in our Canadian canoe, with gypsy tent and frying pan on board, reached it on the crest of a rising flood in mid-July. We entered the land of desolation on wings, and in less than an hour, there was neither boat, nor fishing hut, nor red roof, nor any other sign of human habitation within sight. The sense of remoteness, the fascination of this singular world of willow, wind, and water, instantly laid its spell upon us, and we joked that by rights, we ought to have held some kind of passport to be there, that we come without permission into a separate kingdom of wonder and magic. It was still early in the afternoon, but the wind had wearied us, so we began casting about for a suitable camping ground, and we settled on a sizable island midstream. Landing was anything but straightforward, however. The swirling flood kept carrying us into shore and out again and the willow branches tore at our hands as we snatched at them to stop the canoe. We'd pulled many a yard of sandy bank into the water before at length, with a great sideways blow from the wind, we shot into a backwater and beached the bows in a cloud of spray. And then we just lay panting on the sand. In the full blaze of a scorching sun, a cloudless sky above us, and an immense army of willow bushes closing in from all sides, shouting, clapping their thousand little hands as though to applaud our efforts. <laughs> what a river, eh? I said to my companion, the Swede, and he silently agreed and rolled over for a nap. Now, it was earlier than we usually camped. The sun was still a good hour or two from the horizon, so I left him asleep on the hot sand, and I took a tour of the island. It was less than an acre in extent, a triangle with the apex upstream, a mere sandy bank, really, standing two or three feet above the level of the river. I mean, it was too thickly grown with willows to make walking pleasant, but I made the tour anyway. The far end pointed towards the sinking sun, and I stood there for a few minutes and watched the crimson flood bear down. The ground seemed to shake with the rush of it, and the furious movement of the wind-tossed willow bushes increased the curious illusion that the island itself was moving. From the lower end, away from the sunset, the river looked dark and angry as it poured in and out among the islands and then disappeared with a huge sweep into the willows, which closed about it like a herd of creatures crowding down to drink. They made me think of giant sponges sucking the river up into themselves. It was an impressive scene, and as I gazed at it, a singular emotion began to stir within me. I mean, midway in my delight at the wild beauty, there crept in, unbidden, a curious feeling of disquietude. Now, a raised a rising river perhaps always suggests something of the ominous, but I was aware that my uneasiness lay deeper than all or wonder, 
nor had it directly to do with the tremendous power of the wind. I mean, the wind was simply enjoying itself, for nothing rose out of the flat landscape to stop it, and I was conscious of sharing its great game with a kind of pleasurable excitement. So no, this emotion had nothing to do with the wind. Indeed, so vague was my distress that it was no easy thing to trace it to any source at all. And yet, the emotion, so far as I could understand it, seemed chiefly to attach itself to the willow bushes, to those acres and acres of willows, crowding, swarming everywhere the eye could reach, pressing upon the river as though to suffocate it, shouting and contriving in some way or other to represent to my imagination a new and mighty power that was not altogether friendly. We pitched the tent in a slight depression at the centre of the island where the bushes broke the wind and set about collecting material for a fire. Now, willows drop no branches, of course, so driftwood was our only resource. And we scoured the shores, while everywhere the banks crumbled as the rising flood tore at them. Suddenly, I heard the Swede call out in surprise. Hey, look! I turned round, but he was hidden by the willows. Hey, what the devil is this? I heard him cry again, and this time his voice had become serious, and so I ran up and I joined him on the bank. Look! He was looking out over the river, pointing at something in the water. It's a body! Good grief, it's a, it's a dead body, look! And sure enough, just then, a black thing turning over in the waves swept past us. It was about 20 feet from the shore, and it kept disappearing and coming up to the surface again. But just as it was opposite to where we stood, it suddenly lurched round and looked straight at us. We saw its eyes reflecting the sunset, gleaming an odd yellow, and then it gave a swift plunge and dived out of sight. An otter, <laughs> said the Swede, and it was, it was an otter, alive and out on the hunt, and yet it, it had looked for more than a moment to both of us, I'm quite sure, exactly like the body of a man, a drowned man, turning helplessly in the current. Far below we saw it come to the surface again, its black skin wet and shining in the sunlight, and then, just as we were turning back, with our arms full of driftwood, something else recalled us to the riverbank. And this time, it really was a man. It was a man in a boat. Now, a, a small craft on the Danube is an unusual sight at any time. But here, in this windy desert, it was flood time, remember? Well, I mean, this was a real event. And we both just stood and stared. I mean, whether it was due to the slanting sunlight or its reflection bouncing off the water, I can't say. But for some reason, I found it difficult to focus my eyes on this sudden apparition. I mean, it seemed to be a man, as I've said, standing upright in a sort of flat-bottomed boat, steering with a long oar, and being carried along at the most tremendous pace. He appeared to be looking in our direction, and I thought that he, he was gesticulating at us. Certainly, the sound of a voice came across the water as if he were shouting, but no single words could be made in the wind. He's crossing himself, I said. Look, he's making the sign of the cross. You're right, said the Swede, shading his eyes and watching the man as he melted into the sea of willows. What's he doing out in this flood, I said, and at this time of day? And what, 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 was he, what was he trying to tell us? He, he probably thought we were spirits, said my companion. I mean, these peasants, they believe all sorts of nonsense, don't they? Fairies and elementals, demons too, probably. Ah, he saw our smoke, people on the island for the first time in his life, and it scared him. That's all. <laughs> yeah, well, and I spoke loudly now, I remember, deliberately trying to make as much noise as I could. With enough imagination, you might well people a place like this with the old gods. 
the Romans must have been all over this region with their shrines and their groves. But the subject dropped then and we, we returned to our camp. My friend, he, he was not given to imaginative conversation. And I remember feeling distinctly glad at that moment that he was not. You know, his solid, practical nature seemed a welcome and comforting thing out there as the, the night fell around us. The river's still rising, he said, when we made it back to the camp. This island will be underwater in two days if it goes on like this. Well, I don't care about the river, I said. I, I just wish that this blasted wind would die down. But it didn't. In fact, the wind seemed to grow with the darkness, howling overhead, shaking the willows, and falling upon the water in flat, powerful blows. And other curious sounds accompanied it sometimes too, like the explosion of heavy guns. It made me think of the sounds that a planet must make as it drives along through space. Well, the sky was still clear, and soon after we'd eaten supper, a full bright moon rose and covered the river and the willows with a silvery light. The long day's battle with wind and water had tied us both, and an early bed was the obvious program. But neither of us made a move for the tent. Instead, we lay on the sand by the fire, peering into the willow bushes and listening to the thunder of wind and river. And we spoke no more than was necessary. It was almost as if we'd agreed to avoid discussion of the camp and its incidents. Neither the otter nor the boatman, for instance, were mentioned by either of us. I mean, the human voice, always rather absurd amid the roar of the elements, now carried with it something almost illegitimate. It's like talking out loud in church or in some place where it's perhaps not quite safe to be overheard. I mean, frankly, the eeriness of the island had touched us both. Untrodden by man, it lay on the frontier of an alien world a world tenanted by willows only, and the souls of willows. And we, in our rashness, had dared to invade it. For the last time, I rose to get firewood. And when I reached the point where the sand jutted out into the waves, the spell of the place descended upon me with a positive shock. I mean, no mere scenery could have produced this effect. No, I felt certain now that there was something more here, something positively to alarm a man. The willows, especially. I watched them bustling together around our camp, like an army, shaking their silver spears. And it became absolutely clear to me in that moment that we were not welcome, that our presence here was resented for a night's lodging, perhaps we might be tolerated, but for longer, no. No, 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 no. By all the gods of the trees and the wilderness, no. We were not wanted on that island, and the willows were against us. The cry of a night bird sounded overhead, and I nearly lost my balance as the piece of the bank I was standing on fell with a great splash into the river. I stepped back just in time, and then I turned and was startled to see the Swede standing right in front of me. The roar of the elements had covered his approach. You've been gone a long time, he shouted above the wind. I thought something might have happened. But you see, there was a look in his face that told me much more than his words, and in a flash, I understood the real reason for his coming. The spell of the place had entered his soul too, and he did not like being alone. River's still rising, he cried. We'll need to get off first thing in the morning. Lucky our tent's in the hollow, I cried back. Lucky if we get away without disaster, he shouted. And I remember feeling annoyed with him then for articulating my own thoughts so baldly. We smothered the embers of the fire and turned in. The canoe lay bottom up beside the tent with the two paddles beneath her. The provision sack hung 
from a willow stem and the dishes were removed to a safe distance from the fire all ready for breakfast. The shaking willows and the buffetings of the wind against our tent were the last things that I remembered as sleep came down and covered everything with its soft and delicious forgetfulness. Suddenly I found myself awake, bleary and confused. I looked at my watch and I saw by the moonlight that it was nearly 4 a.m. Then I opened my eyes wide with a start of genuine terror. It was unmistakable. It wasn't the noise of the wind or the river that had disturbed my sleep. It was the slow approach of something on the island. Outside the tent, there was a sound of multitudinous little pattering. So they, they, they were too quiet for footsteps. I mean, they'd been coming, I realized, for a long time and had first become audible in my sleep. But as I lay there now, wide awake, I could hear them clearly outside the tent. It seemed, too, that something was physically pressing against the sides of the tent, weighing down upon it from above. I mean, was it just the wind? You know, what was this pattering, the sound of rain dripping off the willow leaves, spray blown from the river? My nerves were tingling now, and any idea of sleep had fled. So I stuck my head out of the tent, and I saw that there was no rain or spray and that nothing was approaching. The river had risen considerably, but there was no immediate cause for alarm, and everything was exactly as it had been the night before. The turned over canoe, the paddles, the provision sack hanging from the tree, and the willows, of course. The ever trembling willows. I got up and went out a little way into the bush to see across the river to the farther shore. And as I looked again across the sea of bushes, that same indefinable sense of distress took hold of me. Now I tried to resist it, I tried to shake it off. The pattering, the pressure on the tent that had woken me, I must have been the wind, driving the loose hot sand against the canvas and dropping it on our roof. But as I made my way back to the tent, a dreadful realisation leapt out at me, compared to which my vague nervousness of the evening was as nothing. Because I now saw that a change had somehow come about in the arrangement of the landscape. I was certain it wasn't simply that my point of vantage, I was raised on a slight hillock of sand, gave me a different perspective. No, it wasn't that. I was sure that a definite alteration had been affected in the relation of the tent to the willows and the willows to the tent. The bushes were now crowding much closer. They'd moved nearer, unnecessarily, unpleasantly nearer. The willows had closed in during the night. I thought of the pattering sound again, and I swayed for a moment in the wind, struggling to control the thoughts that were now running through my mind. Because if I was right, but I, how could I possibly be right? But if I was right, then there was a suggestion here of personal agency, of active hostility, and it chilled me to the bone. And then the reaction followed. I mean, the idea was so absurd that I'm made to laugh. But no laughter came. Because the knowledge that my mind was now receptive to such ideas brought with it the additional terror that it was through our minds and not through our bodies that an attack would come. I returned to the tent first taking a careful look around, and I, I admit, I made a few small measurements. I paced out the distances between the willows and the tent. And then I crawled back beneath my blankets, and my companion 
to all appearances, still slept soundly, and I was very relieved about that. I mean, provided that my experiences were not corroborated, I could find strength for the time being to deny them. You know, with the daylight, I would be able to persuade myself that this is all subjective, you know, a projection of an excited imagination, fantasy of the night. The sun was already high when the Swede shook me awake and announced that the porridge was ready and that there was just enough time to bathe. River's still rising, he said. Several islands midstream have disappeared altogether. Our own is much smaller. Is, is there any wood left? I asked. <laughs> the wood and the island would finish in a dead heat tomorrow, I reckon. But there's enough to last us till then. Well, the sun was blazing hot, but the wind hadn't abated one jot. I plunged into the icy water from the western point of the island. Gosh, it was an exhilarating sensation. And the terror of the night now seemed to be cleansed out of me. And then suddenly, the Swede's words flashed across my mind. Enough wood to last until tomorrow, he'd said. So he changed his mind. Well, he assumed now that we would stay on the island for another night. I mean, yesterday it seemed so, so positive the other way. Over breakfast, he talked incessantly and inconsequentially, but I could tell that something was up with him. He changed since the night before. I mean, I, I hardly know how to describe it now in cold blood, but at the time, I remember thinking, well, being quite certain that he had become frightened. We'd better get off sharp in an hour, I said presently to him. And his answer made me feel very uncomfortable. If they'll let us, he said. Who'll let us, I said. What, the elements, you mean? The powers of this place, he said. Whoever they are. The gods are here, my friend. If they're anywhere in the world. Yes, I said. Well, that the elements have always been the true immortals. I, I laughed as naturally as I could, but he just said flatly, we'll be lucky if we get away without further disaster. What do you mean, further disaster? I said. The steering paddle's gone for one thing, he said. What? And there's a tear in the bottom of the canoe. There was a tremor in his voice now. The boat is damaged, I said. He nodded and he beckoned me to follow him. The canoe lay next to the tent, ribs uppermost, exactly as I'd seen her during the night. And there was a paddle on the sand beside her. There's only one paddle left, he said, stooping to pick it up. And look, there's the tear. I mean, it was on the tip of my tongue to tell him that I clearly noticed two paddles only a few hours before, but a second impulse made me think better of it. So, I approached the canoe and, oh God, hells, bells, there was a, there was a long, fine rent in the bottom of it, where a sliver of wood had been taken out. It looked as if a sharp rock had eaten down her length, and the hole went right through. I mean, if we'd launched without noticing it, we would have sunk in minutes. An attempt to prepare a victim for the sacrifice, said the Swede. Wasn't there last night? Well, we must have scratched her when we landed, I said. You know, sharp stones along that. And then there's this, interrupted the Swede. He handed me the remaining paddle and he pointed to the blade and I saw that it was scraped down all over. I mean, really well scraped, as though someone had sandpapered it expertly. You know, it had been worn so thin that the first vigorous stroke on the water would have snapped it off at the elbow. Well, one of us must have done this in his sleep, I said. Or it's been funneled down by the sand, blown against it by the wind. How lucky, 
said the Swede, turning away, that you can explain everything. Well, I think I can, actually, yes. Yeah, it was the same wind that caught the steering paddle and flung it so near the bank that it fell in with the next lump that crumbled. Hey! I called after him as he walked away with a dismissive gesture. Once alone, my first thought was that one of us must have done this, and it was certainly not me. But my second thought was how impossible that either of us had done it. I mean, that my companion, my trusted friend of a dozen similar expeditions could have no, 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 never. Equally absurd was the explanation that this densely practical man had suddenly become insane. And yet, the fact remained that some curious alteration had come over him. How he'd become nervous, he was cowed. He was behaving as though he awaited a climax of some kind, a climax that he expected to come soon. I made a hurried examination of the tent and its surroundings, but the measurements that I'd made the night before remained unaltered. I did notice, however, for the first time, a number of hollows formed in the sand, that they were basin-shaped of various depths and sizes, like miniature craters. I mean, it was the wind, of course, no doubt about it. I set the pitch melting to mend the canoe, but it was clear that even under the best conditions, the boat was not going to be safe for travelling until the morrow. And presently, the Swede rejoined me. I drew his attention to the, the hollows in the sand. I know, he said. They're all over the island. But you can explain them, I'm sure, no doubt. Yes. Yes, I can explain them. Little whirlwinds, I suspect. The sand is loose enough to yield, that's all. Well, he made no reply to that, and we worked on in silence. Well, I say silence, in fact, we were silent ourselves. But you see, I'd look at my companion from time to time, and he often seemed to be listening for something. Something that I couldn't hear myself. You know, he'd stop what he was doing, and turn and stare into the bushes and then up at the sky or out across the water where it was visible through the willow bushes. Sometimes he put his hand to his ear and hold it there for a moment. And at length he spoke. Queer thing about that otter last night. Yes, I said, yeah. Just shows how lonely this place is. Otters are shy little things. I don't mean that. I mean, do you think that it really was an otter? <laughs> what else could it have been? Yeah, but I saw it before you, and at first it seemed to me so much bigger than an otter. Well, perhaps the sunset magnified it or something, I said. He looked at me absently for a moment. It had such extraordinary yellow eyes. Well, that was the sun, clearly, too, I said. Oh, come on. I suppose you'll ask next whether that fellow in the boat was. Well, I did rather wonder about that man in the boat, yes. I remember thinking at the time, it wasn't a man. It seemed to rise so suddenly out of the water. Oh, God, look now, come on, please. This place is queer enough without going out of your way to imagine things. The boat was just an ordinary boat, okay? And the man in it was a regular man. The otter was a common and garden otter. So please, you know, don't let's play the fool about this now. And for heaven's sakes, you know, stop making out that you can hear things. You're giving me the jumps, and there's, there's nothing to hear here but the, the river and this confounded wind. You're a fool, he said in a low voice. That's the way that all victims talk. As if you didn't understand just as well as I do. What? So you're telling me that you really suppose? No, he said. The best thing that you can do is keep quiet now, my friend. And hold your mind firm. 
This wretched attempt at self-deception only makes the truth harder when you're forced to meet it. Well, I had nothing more to say. Because I knew that he was right. I was the fool, not him. I mean, he'd known from the very beginning, apparently. And thenceforward, I dropped all pretense myself. And my fear increased steadily to the climax. That afternoon, while the canoe dried and hardened, the island grew perceptibly smaller as the banks were torn away with great gulps and splashes. The weather kept fine until about four o'clock, and then for the first time in three days, the wind showed signs of dropping, and clouds began to gather in the southwest. Now, the lessening of the wind was a, a relief, of course, but the silence that came with its sudden cessation at about five o'clock was in a matter quite as oppressive. The booming of the river now held everything in its way and filled the air with murmurs, more musical than the wind, but infinitely more monotonous. Under the clouds, the river seemed to grow blacker and the willows to stand more densely together. And yet somehow they kept up a sort of independent movement of their own, rustling when no wind stirred them and shaking oddly from the roots upwards. I dreaded the approach of night We'd covered the canoe with a waterproof sheet and the one remaining paddle had been tied to the base of a tree. From five o'clock I busied myself with a stew pot and my companion smoked his pipe. No more talk about undesirable things passed between us and I think that his only remarks were to do with the, the gradual erosion of the island. But when the pot had just begun to bubble, I heard his voice calling me from the bank where he'd wandered without my noticing. Hey, come and listen. See what you make of this. He was holding his hand to his ear as I'd seen him earlier. Do you hear it? He said. I listened, and at first I could only hear the deep notes and hissing of the water. The willows, for once, were silent and motionless. But then a sound did begin to reach my ears. Faintly at first, it was a peculiar sound, like the humming of a distant gong. It seemed to come across the darkness from the waste of swamps and willows, but it was certainly not the sound of a bell. It, it wasn't the hooting of a steamer. I mean, I can liken it to nothing so much as the sound of an immense gong, suspended far up in the sky, soft and musical, repeating a muffled metallic note. My heart quickened as I listened. I've heard it all day, said my companion. This afternoon it came all around the island, but I could never get near enough to localize it. Sometimes it was overhead, Sometimes it seemed to be under the water. You know, once or twice I could have sworn that it wasn't outside at all, but within me, you know? The way of sound in the fourth dimension is supposed to come. I was too puzzled to pay much attention to his words, but I kept listening, striving unsuccessfully to associate it with any known sound that I could think of. It, it did, it kept changing direction, he was right about that now coming nearer, and then sinking away into the distance. I, I, I can't say that it was ominous in itself, because it did seem to me distinctly musical. But it set going a distressing feeling that made me wish that I'd never heard it. it comes from the willow bushes, said the Swede. But the wind's dropped, I said. The willows can hardly make a noise by themselves, can they? And his answer frightened me. It's because the wind has dropped that we can hear it now. 
It was drowned out before. It is, I believe, the cry of the hang on. I dash back to the fire, warned by the sound of bubbling that the stew was in danger, but keen at the same time to escape further conversation. You know, I, I, I dreaded that he was going to start going on again about the gods or the elemental forces or whatever, and I wanted to keep myself well in hand for whatever might happen later. You know, there was another night to be faced before we could get away, and there was no knowing what it might bring. Come and, and bring, cut up some bread for the pot, I called to him. He came over slowly and took the provision sack from the tree. He fumbled inside it, and then with a burst of mirthless laughter, he emptied the contents onto the ground sheet at his feet. There's nothing there! <laughs> there is no bread, he shouted. They've taken our bread! What? I dropped the ladle and ran up, and he was right. Everything the sack had contained lay upon the ground sheet, and there was no bread. The oatmeal, too, said the Swede. Look, there's much less than there was this morning. Well, there's enough for breakfast, I said, and we can stock up again easily enough tomorrow afternoon. In a few hours, we'll be miles away from here, unless we're claimed for the sacrifice. He dragged the sack into the tent. I heard him mumbling indistinctly to himself. Well, that meal was beyond question a very gloomy one. We avoided eye contact and we washed up in silence. And then, once smoking, my mind unoccupied with any definite duties, the apprehension that I'd felt all day became more and more acute curious gong-like sound became almost incessant and filled the stillness of the night with a faint, continuous ringing now, rather than a series of notes. At one time it was behind us, and then it was in front. Sometimes, I fancied, it came from the bushes on our left, and then from the clumps on our right. Most often, it hovered directly overhead, like the whirring of wings. Once, when the sound had come very near, or directly over our heads, and were ringing louder than ever, the Swede suddenly spoke. I don't think that a gramophone would show any record of that. I don't know about you, but the sound doesn't come to me by the ears. The vibrations reach me in another manner altogether. They're within me, which is precisely how a fourth dimensional sound might be supposed to make itself heard. I made no reply, and he went on. It has that about it, which is out of common experience. It's a non-human sound, by which I mean a sound outside humanity. Well, having rid himself of this indigestible morsel, he lay quiet. But the fact was that he'd so admirably expressed my own feeling that it was a relief of sorts to have the thought out there. The solitude of that Danube camping place, I shall never forget. The feeling of being utterly alone on an empty planet. My thoughts ran incessantly upon cities and the haunts of men. I would have given my soul for the feel of those shabby Bavarian villages we passed through. There were peasants drinking beer, tables beneath the trees, the normal human commonplaces. And yet what I felt was no ordinary ghostly fear. It was infinitely greater and stranger. It was ancestral. We had strayed, as the Swede had put it, into some region where the risks were great and yet unintelligible. Here, the frontiers of an unknown and hostile world lay close about us. It was a spot held by the dwellers of some outer space, a sort of peephole, 
whence they could spy upon the earth, themselves unseen, a point where the veil had worn thin. It's the deliberate, calculating purpose that saps the courage, said the Swede suddenly. Otherwise, imagination could count for a lot, but the paddle, the canoe, the bread. He made other remarks too, about the plain determination to provide a victim. But I, I recognize it was simply the cry of his frightened soul against the certain knowledge that we were now being attacked. Meanwhile, the fire had died down and the darkness came close up to our faces. Occasionally a stray puff of wind sets the willow shivering, but otherwise the only sounds were the gurgling of the river and the humming in the air. At length, I reached the point where I simply had to speak. I kicked the fire into a blaze and I turned to my companion. Look here now, I can't, I can't stand this place any longer. I'm half inclined to make a swim for it now. What do you say? But he only stared at me, and he answered with unnatural calm, no. It's not a physical condition that we can escape from by running away. We can only sit and wait. There are forces close to us now that could kill a herd of elephants as easy as you or I could squash a fly. Our only chance is to keep still, my friend. Our insignificance alone may save us. They know that we're here, you see, but they've not found us yet. They're blundering about like men hunting for a gas leak. They can feel us, I think, but they can't actually see us. We must keep our minds quiet. It is our minds that they feel. We must control our thoughts, or it is all up with us. What, death, you mean? Oh, the worse. Far worse. Death means annihilation, or release from the limitations of the senses, but it involves no change of character. You don't suddenly just alter because the body's gone, but this, this means a radical alteration, a complete change, a loss of oneself by substitution. It's far, far worse than death, my friend. And it's not even annihilation. We happen to have camped in a spot where their region touches ours and where the veil between has worn thin. I shuddered as he used my very own phrase, my actual words. But who are they? He said. And he leaned forward a little over the fire. All my life, he said, I've been strangely, vividly conscious of another region, not far removed from our own world in one sense, and yet wholly different, where great things go on, where immense and terrible personalities hurry by, intent on vast purposes, compared to which our earthly affairs are as dust in the balance. Vast purposes, I mean, that deal directly with the soul, I thought at first perhaps it was the old gods. You thought it was the elements, but it's neither. I mean, they would have been comprehensible entities. They have relations with men. They depend upon us for worship or sacrifice. But these beings who are about us now, they have nothing to do with men. It is mere chance that their space happens to be at this spot touching ours. Well, what do you propose then? I said. A sacrifice, he said. A victim may distract them until we can get away. 
Just as the wolves stop to devour the dogs and give the sleigh another start. But I see no chance of any other victim now. I mean, it's the willows, of course. You know that, don't you? The willows mask the others. But the others are feeling about for us. If we let our minds betray our fear, we are lost. I mean, the expression on his face was so calm and determined that I no longer had any doubts about his sanity. If we can hold through the night, we may get off in the daylight unnoticed, or at least undiscovered. Well, and you really think that a sacrifice would... That gong-like humming now came down very close over our heads as I spoke, and my friend raised his hand. Hush! Don't mention them any more than you can help, and do not give them a name. To name is to reveal, and our only hope lies in ignoring them. We must keep them out of our minds at all costs. I raked the fire to prevent the darkness and everything having its own way. I have never longed for the light of the sun as ardently as I longed for it then in the awful blackness of that summer night. The gong-like note hummed noisily for a moment rising and falling like the wind. What is it? I said, what is that sound? It's their world, he said. The humming in their region. The division here, you see, is so thin, it leaks through somehow. But if you listen carefully, you'll find it's not above us, so much as around us. It's in the willows. It's the willows themselves humming. Because here, the willows have been made symbols of the forces that are against us. He suddenly thrust his face close into mine. The only thing for us to do is to go on as though nothing has happened. Eh? Follow all our usual habits. Pretend that we feel nothing and notice nothing. Above all, don't think. Because what you think happens. All right, I said. I will try. But look, one more thing. Those hollows in the ground, the, 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 those sand funnels, I mean, well, what do you make of them? No, please don't ask me that, he said. But, but, but you said yourself, no, no, please do not ask me that. No! I dare not. Put that into words. If you have not guessed, my friend, then I am glad. Please do not try to guess. They've put it into my mind. You try your hardest to prevent them. And then he stopped in horror and tried to smother the sound of his voice. But I had heard it too. A strange new cry from the darkness and a sudden drop in the air as though something had come nearer. Suddenly, he leapt up and started backing away from the fire, and I instinctively followed him. After that, we must go, he said. We must strike camp and go, down the river, without delay. Now! Now! His words were dictated, I could see, by abject terror, and then suddenly he hissed, Oh, God, look! God in heaven, look! And for the first time in my life, I knew what it was to hear tears of terror in a human voice. He was pointing back towards the fire, which is some 50 feet away now. And as I followed the direction of his finger, my heart lurched. Because there, in front of the dim glow, something was moving. I saw it as a veil like the gauze drop curtain used at the back of a theatre. It was neither a human figure nor an animal. I mean, to me, it gave the impression of being as large as several animals grouped together, like, like horses, two or three horses together, moving slowly. 
the Swede expressed it differently. To him, it was shaped like a clump of willow bushes, rounded at the top and moving all over their surface, coiling upon themselves like smoke, he said afterwards. It's coming this way, he cried. Oh, God, they found us. They found us. We must get away now, now. One terrified glance enabled me to see that the shadowy form was indeed swinging towards us now through the bushes. Then I tripped backwards into the bushes and the Swede fell on top of me and we fell in a tumbling, struggling heap into the sand. I hardly knew what was happening. I was conscious only of an enveloping sensation of dread that plucked the nerves out of their fleshly covering and twisted them. My eyes were tightly shut, and something in my throat choked me, a feeling that my consciousness was extending out into space, swiftly gave way to another feeling that I was losing everything and was about to die. And then a spasm of the most intense pain shot through me, and I screamed out, dimly aware that the Swede had caught hold of my arm and had fallen heavily upon it. How much time passed before I was next aware of anything, I do not know. But I found myself scrabbling up out of willow branches, and I saw my companion standing in front of me, holding out a hand to assist me. You nearly broke my arm in two, I said. And that's what saved you. I lost consciousness, that's what saved me. You know, it made me stop thinking about them. Between us, we've managed to set them off on a false track somewhere. Listen, the humming has stopped. A silent pause, and then a wave of hysterical laughter seized hold of me and spread to my friend. Great healing gusts of laughter shook us as we made our way back to the fire, we saw that the tent had fallen over and lay in a tangled heap upon the ground. So we picked it up, and as we righted it, we both tripped several times in the sand. Look, it's those sand funnels, said the Swede. And just look at the size of them. And sure enough, all around the tent, where we had seen the moving shadows were those deep funnel-shaped hollows in the sand, exactly like the ones that we'd already found all over the island, only far bigger and deeper, and beautifully formed. Neither of us spoke anymore after that discovery. We both knew that sleep was the safest thing that we could do, and we went to bed without further delay. Difficulty in breathing woke me, and my first thought was that my companion had rolled onto me in his sleep. So I called out and I sat up. That sound of multitudinous soft pattering was again outside, and in that instant it came to me that the tent was surrounded, and I realized that the Swede was no longer inside. I dashed out, seized by a dreadful fear for his safety. And the moment that I was in the open air, I found myself plunged into a torrent of humming. It surrounded me from every quarter, intensely loud, the sound seeming to thicken the very atmosphere. I could hardly breathe. I ran frantically about the island, calling my friend, shrieking out his name. But the willows smothered my voice, and the humming muffled it, and the sound only travelled a few feet around me. I plunged through the bushes, tumbling over roots, scraping my face on branches, and then I came abruptly out upon the island's point, and I saw a dark figure outlined between the water and the sky. And it was the Swede, of course. He'd stripped off 
and he already had one foot in the river. A moment more and he would have plunged in, so I threw myself upon him, flinging my arms around his waist and dragging him back to the shore. He struggled and kicked and made a noise. His noise was just like the humming itself. He ranted about going forth to them and taking the way of the water and the wind and God only knows what other nonsense besides. But in the end, I dragged him back to the tent and I flung him breathless upon the mattress where I held on to him until the fit had passed. And I think that the suddenness with which it went, his fit, I mean, coinciding with an equally abrupt cessation of the humming and pattering outside. I think that was almost the strangest part of the whole business. Because suddenly, he opened his eyes, turned his face to me, and said, for all the world like a frightened child, my life, friend, I owe you my life. But it's over now. They found another victim. And then he dropped back on the blankets and went to sleep. I mean, literally under my eyes, he simply collapsed and began to snore as healthily as though nothing had happened. As if he had never tried to offer his life as a sacrifice by drowning. And when the sunlight woke him three hours later, it seemed that he remembered nothing of what he had tried to do. And I deemed it wise to hold my peace and ask no dangerous questions. I mean, he woke naturally, as I've said, when the sun was already high. And he at once set about preparing to bathe. I followed him anxiously down to the water's edge. But he didn't even attempt to immerse himself. He just dipped his head into the water and made some remark about how cold it was. The river's falling at last, he said. The humming's stopped too, I said. And he looked at me and nodded gently. And it was clear that he remembered everything. It stopped because... because they found another victim, I said. He nodded and then they began to look curiously about him. Come on. I think if we look, we can probably find it. He started off at a run, keeping to the banks, poking with a stick among the sandy bays and backwaters, and I followed him. Ah! He exclaimed presently and came to a stop. He pointed with his stick at a large black object that lay half in the water and half on the sand. It appeared to be caught by some twisted willow roots. A few hours before the spot, must have been under water. Look, see, he said, when I caught up with him. And when I peered over his shoulder, I saw that he was pointing at the lifeless body of a man, a corpse. The face was hidden in the sand, and the current had torn away much of the clothing from the body, so that the neck and part of the back lay bare. The victim, said the Swede. The victim that made our escape possible. I mean, clearly this fellow had been drowned but a few hours before, and his body must have been swept down upon our island somewhere around dawn, which was the very time that my friend's fit had passed. Come on, we must give it a decent burial, he said. And he reached out to pull the body into the shore. But immediately, he uttered a sharp cry. Ah! And I sprang back as if I'd been shot. Because the moment that we touched the body, there arose from its surface the loud sound of humming. The sound of several hummings which passed with a vast commotion like winged things in the air about us and then disappeared into the sky. It was exactly as though we had disturbed some creatures at work. Before either of us had time to properly recover from the shock, a movement of the current had released the corpse from the grip of the willow roots and it had turned over. 
Its dead face was now staring up at the sky as it lay on the edge of the main stream. In another moment, it would be swept away. The Swede started to save it, saying something about a proper burial. And then he dropped to his knees with a cry and he covered his eyes with his hands. I was beside him in an instant and I saw exactly what he'd seen because just as the body swung round in the current, the face and the chest turned full towards us and showed us plainly how the skin and the flesh were indented with small hollows, beautifully formed and exactly similar in shape and kind to the sand funnels that we found all over the island. Is there Mark? My companion croaked in horror. Is that awful Mark? And when I turned my eyes again to the river, I saw that the current had done its work. The body had been swept into midstream and was already beyond our reach. It was turning over and over on the waves, like an otter. <laughs> <laughs>